How many of you here in the audience have actually attempted to start a city? The great ideas of the future are going to happen in cities. Uh, we actually love that kind of problem of chaos and blindness and diversity and mixity of uses. What I think is that the city is all about coming together for the reason of connecting up with networking of networks, synergetic activities. This brawl is not a free market phenomenon. The brawl is a government created phenomenon. So, as any kind of over state branch and colony in fact, historically, the big difference it was that idea in the 1950s, but it's not a suicidal idea in 2000. You know, the more we prevent people from living in San Francisco, the worse that is for the environment. Stop subsidizing the automobile, stop building all these damn highways. Basically, there's no market. That's why it's impossible. Why are we preventing people from living in transit served locations? Because there's incumbent homeowners that don't like it. I don't think that the homeowners should necessarily have this power to prevent the development of our heritage. And I find that Olympiaism is in the end the force behind the politics. That sense of entitlement needs to be broken. Planners, I don't think, is the right word anymore because. They're not planning, <laughs> they're reacting. And the amount of damage destroys from things not happening. You know, 90% of what is done when you're looking at what to do with a site is just compliance. Mm -hmm. Totally silence or blocks off any innovation creativity. The, the profession becomes boring and stifling, so that's how it's created. The same thing goes for developers, and they've been trained to be compliance machines. You know, as a developer, if you want to be creative, well, first find a loophole. These are all invitations for corruption. Planning has to happen at various levels. Those duration ventures need to go by something. This really could be an bottom up order which will give back to the city a sense of identity and coherence. And we should also allow for something new to emerge to something more anarchic and chaotic. Cities. No matter how much you want to plan it, are emerging order. Try out as much freedom as possible and be not paranoid about freedom and what could come out of it. Welcome to An Architecture, episode 18. For this episode, we had the opportunity to record an event put on by an organization called Startup Cities. This was a discussion between Patrick Schumacher, principal of the world-class architecture firm Zaha Hadid Architects, and Adam Hengels, the founder of Market Urbanism, a website and blog promoting market-based solutions to development of the built environment. As our listeners know, we're already big fans of Patrick Schumacher. We produced a four-episode series on him. That was our episodes 9 through 12, which included an interview with Patrick in episode 11. In addition to being one of the top architects in the world, what makes Patrick so compelling to us is that he has been outspoken about his libertarian ideas, and particularly ideas about development of the built environment. We've been following market urbanism for a while now, both the blog and the Twitter feed, which I highly recommend. And that's run by Stephen Smith, who combines a deep knowledge of the obscure minutia of zoning codes in just about every city in America with a snarky sense of humor that I think listeners of our podcast will appreciate. You know, we say things like, gee, should government privatize the roads? Then I'll see a tweet from Mark and Urbanism that's like, why hasn't Durango, Colorado changed from FAR1 to FAR2.5? Exclamation mark, exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> These guys really have their fingers on the pulse. And of course, just from the description that Tim gave, the market urbanism philosophy is very close to our own. For those of you who follow us on Twitter, you've probably realized that about half of our Twitter feed is just retweets of market urbanism content. <laughs> yeah, and if you ever get the impression that we actually know what we're talking about with all this urbanism stuff, generally we've been reading something on the market urbanism blog just before we started recording. <laughs> <laughs> we're not urbanists, we just play one on our podcast. <laughs> I like to think of us as the color commentary on urbanism and urban issues. 
So we're like Dennis Miller, you know, in the announcer's booth at the NFL game. <laughs> Whereas Mark and Urbanism, they're the play-by-play. They actually know what's going on and are calling all the shots of what's happening out there in uh, the world of urbanism. Yeah, but we're trying to work up to John Madden status. Bam! Bam! So being fanboys as we are of both Patrick Schumacher and Mark at Urbanism, you can imagine my surprise one day when I see this announcement on Twitter that Patrick and Adam Hengels, the founder of Mark at Urbanism, we're going to be speaking together at an event called Startup Cities in New York in January. I had been looking out for an opportunity to try to reconnect with Patrick at some point, so this seemed like a perfect opportunity, not only to, to see him again, but also to get to know the Market Urbanism guys. And the organization putting on the event was called Startup Cities. This is the brainchild of a guy named Peter Ryan, who's really interested in startups, you know, business startups, and that entrepreneurial spirit as well as urbanism and, and issues related to the built environment. So the idea behind Startup Cities, as you'll hear him say here, is to bring investors and entrepreneurs from, st- from the startup community to the fields of urban planning, real estate development, and architecture, so that we can infuse cities in the built environment with some of this entrepreneurial spirit from the startup community that's often missing from what are sometimes commoditized utilities <laughs> and the sort of rigid, you know, uncreative ways that governments deal with issues in cities. I thought this was a great event. They probably had about 100 people there. It was a packed house. The discussion was pretty wide-ranging. The topics covered some familiar ground for our audience. For one thing, we did four episodes about Patrick. And for market urbanism, I mean, I see that as kind of a reflection of of a lot of our ideas about the built environment. So you hear Patrick and Adam each talk about uh, how they became interested in these ideas. They'll talk about the future of cities and how we expect to see an increase in urbanization, cities getting larger, cities getting denser, and all of the benefits that come out of this type of agglomeration. There's some criticism of zoning and and other kinds of regulatory standards, which have a lot of negative outcomes in terms of housing affordability and, and land affordability and even creativity for architects and developers. They talk a bit about digital design. Adam actually has founded a startup called Paraffin, which uses computer-generated design to allow developers to test thousands of options for the way that they might develop a site based on the regulatory requirements and budget constraints and some of the programmatic goals, which is really interesting. And then, of course, Patrick is the head of Zaha Hadid Architects, which is one of the world's leading architecture firms in terms of design and design technology. So they have really been on the cutting edge of computational design within the architectural world. There's a question of whether cities should be planned or or to what extent planning might be appropriate, even in a a private city or a privately developed city, which is part of the idea behind startup cities is that we should be thinking about developing new cities as an entrepreneurial venture rather than something that defaults to a government as the prime mover behind its creation. They addressed the environmental benefits of cities, of living in dense cities, and how planning regulations often have environmental consequences, creating sprawl and and much less efficient ways of living. Another topic was things like land use regulations to protect water resources and and other natural resources. How do you deal with that without relying on the types of regulations that we have today? There was another question about kind of which cities and which places around the world are most difficult to work in. And they talk about the kind of delays that come out of the planning process and not only delays, but, but canceled projects and postponed projects and all that value that is lost in the sunk cost of the planning process. And they both had a couple of funny anecdotes there about delays on projects. There's so another question about the power that homeowners should have in determining what gets built within their neighborhoods and cities, and whether there's justification for the kind of nimbyism that often causes some of these project delays. There's a question about data-driven tools for cities. So this is really the whole smart cities discussion, when that's appropriate and when that can be valuable and when it can be problematic or, or reinforcing for the kind of negative effects that city planners create. Then there was a great question, you know, saying that, well, here we are at Startup Cities. Has anybody actually tried to start up a city here in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> so Adam and Patrick talked about why someone might want to start up a city and some efforts that have been made to start private cities. So that's a bit of an overview of the whole discussion. A quick note about the audio quality here. Apparently, nobody told Tim that when you're miking up an event, it's a good idea not to put the mics directly next to a jet engine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, was, you know, I wanted to do this really professionally, so I, um, 
I, I had a couple different microphones I went down there with, and um, I was debating whether or not to bring my, my microphone stand, because, you know, this thing's like, even folded up, it's like almost three feet long. And, you know, I got to get that down there on a bus somehow. But, I, you know, I decided to take it. So I had this microphone, I get it on the bus, get off the bus. I have it like strapped to my backpack, you know, so I'm walking around Manhattan like Boba Fett with this thing sticking up <laughs> out of my backpack. <laughs> So I get there and, you know, I, I kind of set up in the back of the room. It's kind of a wide and shallow room. So I set up in the back so I'd be out of the way. There's some kind of bleacher seating up there. I got the microphone set up, stuck it way up in the air so it would be up above everybody's voices and everything. Did all my sound checks while people were coming into the space. The room quieted down to start the event. And I hear this god-awful noise coming through the microphone <laughs> and realized that when I stuck the whole thing way up in the air, I was right under a, an air vent. <laughs> So I did what I could with it, and Joe's done his wizardry on the audio processing, but it was kind of quiet even at the event. The microphones were a bit quiet. There was some HVAC noise, so we've done what we could with what we got, <laughs> but the audio quality is a little challenging in some spots. Yeah, so there's a trade-off between noise reduction and legibility of what the people are actually saying, because HVAC and speech tend to have some of the same frequencies. In particular, Patrick's voice is a bit quiet and muffled at some points. Quick edit here. After recording this witty banter, we did manage to find another recording of the event, courtesy of Peter Ryan, which had much better audio quality than what Tim had recorded. Which is funny when you consider that Tim had brought all this professional recording gear down to New York City, and the one we end up using is probably came off of someone's iPhone. But it's still not perfect. There was still some of this HVAC noise that I talked about. So we have cleaned it up a bit more, but if you have trouble understanding any of what's said, jump onto our show notes page at anarchitecturepodcast.com slash ANA018, and we'll have a detailed outline posted there so that you can follow along. We also have YouTube versions of each of our podcast episodes. It's usually just a, a splash screen of our logo with the audio podcast over the top of it. But for this one, we've made some slides that's kind of closed captioning of, of our notes about the discussion. So you can find that at our YouTube channel. Just search An Architecture Podcast on YouTube. So the recorded event here is about an hour and a half long. Then after that, in this episode, Joe and I will come back on and talk about some highlights of the discussion and kind of give our own spin on, on some of the points that were discussed. Yeah, that's our John Madden post-game analysis. Bam! Bam! We are startup cities, and this is a fantastic event we've been looking forward to. My name is Peter Ryan. I'm your host for the evening, and I'll be moderating the discussion between Patrick and Adam. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. I hope you all got a refreshment, a little snack, and you're all settled in. Um, first off, I want to thank our band okay, partner. Sure. <laughs> 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 Let's have a little fun. Uh, I'd like to thank our band partner, Rise. Uh, they're a co-working space. Please uh, check them out. If there's uh, any co-working space need you might have, uh, they'll be of service. Uh, and then a little bit about startup cities and what we're trying to do. Our mission is to bring a nexus of academics, urbanists, investors, and entrepreneurs to find ways to talk about a lot of the energy that's placed within the startup or the tech community and bring that over to the urban planning, the architecture, the real estate, and development community. And so what we found is bringing these speakers together, panels or debates or uh, more lecture-style events, gives a great way to inform of really interesting products that are going on uh, and get also a look into what some of the academics are doing in the classroom and the research halls, as well as what, uh, you know, maybe some government agencies are doing inside their offices. Uh, so our past speakers, you can take a look right here just to see. Uh, there we go. Uh, just to see uh, some of the fantastic spaces that we've had previously. Um, uh, here's what some of our past events would look like. Uh, definitely keep in touch with us. Our website is starcities.com, uh, and you can find all the updates on our coming events. Uh, again, we want to thank our partners that collaborated with us to put this event forward. Once again, RISE, uh, Cairo Society, Mark Urbanism, Digital.NYC, Urbanists, our live stream partner. If you have any friends that could not attend, please tell them to go to facebook.com slash urbanist live to look at the live stream. Uh, 1517 Fund, Rex, 
Urban X Accelerator, and they also have the, uh, applications for their Startup Accelerator program focused specifically on urban tech uh, open right now. So if you have a company that would be interested in that, please check that out. Uh, and finally, the Soho Forum Debate Series. To set the tone for this evening, I just wanted to uh, talk about a little subject about New York City and how this might relate to the discussion. 40% uh, of the buildings in Manhattan could not be built today. Uh, this is due to uh, zoning and cumbersome regulation. Um, you know, because they're too tall, as you can see, for too many businesses. And so the point being is that innovation often gets stifled and what we think of is going on in the city and some of the iconic buildings that we uh, cherish. Uh, they were built at a time when there were more market forces in the back. Uh, and so with that being said, I'd like to look the floor now to Adam Nagels, founder of Market Urbanism, and Patrick Schumacher, principal of Zaha Dita Architects. Uh, and we'll be having a discussion where I'll be moderating, uh, you know, talking about these subject matters from their specific backgrounds. So, that being said. All right, so I'd like to uh, open up with Patrick, if you could please uh, give a little bit of background about how you feel. Okay. <laughs> well, I came down 20 years ago, that's one element. <laughs> and um, pretty much exactly I was doing, and at that time I was a uh, communist. Heavy <laughs> 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 work in Marxism, eating Marx and so on, and I was trying to argue that. Oh, actually, at that time it was going to argue that it was two other people. And um, so we developed all the years into that company. And I was also all the way through researching, uh, researching, writing, working, and the field of architecture at the University of Mathematics. And I didn't want to be a totally bookish creature, but I had an all the philosophy about my interest in political economy, sociology, and that influenced them also. Uh, where I started to look at architecture and industry related to societal progress. And um, in terms of my political evolution, I became less radical for a while and became more mainstream. <laughs> and then I got re radicalized in 2008 um, through that international crash, which was a big shake up, of course, for me personally. I brought into Scotland and passed it down like. <laughs> and um, the firm had a lot of the uh, work I broke off and continued on in other areas, which then kind of then also sound like the whole field during that during that process. But the two people who made already that is rapidly evolved into uh, towards the other time was a bit discovering in that debate. Um, um, trying to find out what happened and uh, how I could explain that and what to prepare to move from there. So I discovered these institutes and their explanations um, of business cycles, also business cycles, cycle theory, and also that more and more. And I'm just in the political side of also economics, uh, art capitalism, and start to think uh, how to reply back to a lot of issues. Um, so that's why I'm not here. Great. And if you can get a little bit of information about your body. Uh, yeah, so I, um, let's see. I actually, in college, I started out in architecture, but basically dropped out once I got into the studio classes and didn't find them as uh, rigorous and as interesting as I wanted them to be. I transitioned into structural engineering, which was a little more... Uh, Mathematically rigorous and complex. Um, uh, so, when I got out of my uh, engineering education, worked as a structural engineer for five years, designing buildings and things like that. But there's a there was an entrepreneurial side of me that wasn't being recognized. So, uh, I decided to go transition into real estate development. 
I went back to uh, graduate school for, for in our real estate development program at MIT. Um, I decided I wanted at that time wanted my focus to be on, on so-called mega projects, you know, big multi-billion dollar projects where you master plan an entire neighborhood. Um, came out of the MIT program at MIT where I wrote my thesis on that topic. Um, and ended up working here in, in Brooklyn uh, before City Ratner and the Atlantic Arts Project for uh, seven and a half years. But I worked on that pro project, but during that time, I guess kind of uh, while I was at Forest City Ratner, I started the Market Urbanism website uh, under a pseudonym, because obviously my employer would not have been a fan of that <laughs> uh, And so, um, but basically, with the ideas that came about in market urbanism kind of came to fruition in several different stages. Part of it was when I was in architecture school, I was introduced to the ideas that were relatively new at the, at the time, such as new urbanism and things like that, uh, which were considered on the cutting edge. And I had an appreciation for cities and an urban way of life. Having grown up in the suburbs of Chicago, I didn't think it was actually that great of a place for a kid to grow up. Um, and uh, and so the, the seeds were kind of planted for an appreciation for urbanism until, and then when I actually took economics coursework, both in preparation for a master's degree and within my master's degree, I started to appreciate the, the economic way of thinking and started to analyze cities and the way we build buildings from that point of view. Um, and so a lot of this came into fruition while I was at Forest City Ratner, working on what I thought was, you know, what I was meant to do, which was mega projects. And I saw kind of what what's actually happening behind the scenes. You know, that's a five billion dollar project, but hundreds of millions of dollars of public subsidy. Eminent domain was used in that project. Uh, so that's you know the bad things that are happening, you know, between the government and the private developer. But at the same time, we had, you know, a very extremely vocal NIMBY group who basically prevented a, a good development from being great and also, you know, stalled the project for many years. Um, so I, I guess, yes, part of it is just an understanding of economics and realizing, you know, the sprawl that we talked about of being bad in architecture school, actually that has to do with economics. The government builds these roads, everything ends up spreading out, and at the same time, ur urban renewal, slum clearance, zoning, all these things hollow out our, the cities and cause people to spread out. And they started, you know, they started to see that sprawl is not, you know, a, a free market phenomenon. Small sprawl is a government created phenomenon. And I felt someone needed to say this. Um, and when I looked out into the libertarian ecosystem, I didn't see anyone saying that. I saw people in Randall O'Toole saying actually the opposite. Uh, and I think someone needs to say something. Someone needs to actually put these ideas out there. Um, you know, and then Stephen Smith started picking up on this and started writing himself uh, on, the, on the website. And other people started picking up. So just like over the years, it's grown into, you know, I think in a way it's a, it's a movement. Um, and in a way, I feel like, like, like the mainstream has come along. At least the mainstream intelligentsia has come along and there's now seems to be... Uh, a consensus among both planners and urban intelligentsia, planning professors and things like that. They'll at least admit that zoning is a problem. And that this housing crisis that we're currently in, and especially in New York and San Francisco, London, you know, it is, is, has a lot to do with zoning. And that's something we've been saying for a long time. And I feel like, you know, finally, you know, people are coming to accept that. Uh, I guess the next step is, is closing that gap between you know, the intelligentsia and the mainstream people, because if you walk up to someone on the street and say, should we get rid of zoning? What are you, what are you crazy? <laughs> you know? But you talk to a planner or, or, or a professor in an urban planning school, then probably say, yeah, the zoning's causing a lot of trouble. I feel that um, what we call the intelligentsia is quite a good product, at least in Europe, clearly. Um, 
Ja, auch das ist ein Treffer, wo uns dann so sehr die Sonne, die kommt, kommt, oder von dem Vorwort, ja, aber ja, das ist so ein Unternehmen, ein Gäste, die es da kommt, weil die Frau sind wirklich hier zu kommen. Das ist jetzt nicht schon vor. Und in ihrer Neurodural Transformation und Revolution occurred, there was only resistance and rejection, mostly in the intellectual universities of our profession, of course those who had things on business, you know, and you know, they were running with whatever was coming their way, but in terms of discourse, there was a full rejection of anything to do with neoliberal and neoliberal and it's very, very easy that you get stunned, disbelieved, with a kind of things you know, from colleagues. And now, pre-2008, now pre being in the thick of architecture and seeing it up close, uh, were you finding these observations yourself back then, even though you might not peg it exactly as, you know, what you now would say? Well, it was a relevant transformation from, uh, as, also through the kind of things I'm reading, I was, I was almost economically interested in the mental sense to me, um, uh, a lot of the ideas of, you know, that was, you know, uh, there was also an interesting discourse, all the Marxist discourse, which was so called post-Protestant discourse. Just sort of heard of this, the idea of transformations. I just look at things historically and, and see technology as a driver. And think of the uh, microcurrent revolution, the convergence of computation, communication, and the way it's allowed. The acceleration of sites of innovation, RD, marketing, financing, putting together the cities, mass customization, away from this kind of forced paradigm of mechanical mass production, which was. 20th century, most of the 20th century, which sort of urbanization was part and parcel of and more compatible with. I agree with you that then on top of this, a lot of this was subsidized. So it also makes sense in an era where uh, there's only five things the society produces across decades, which is kind of a cold face, uh, a washing machine, one or two TV channels, uh, electrification, very simple industrial base for infrastructure and, and for everybody, this kind of industrial production. You can spread out and, um, and kind of interpersonal layers <laughs> in decades. First of all, who wants to be here? Everybody's understood even where and so on. According to the kind of plan. This was also possible that at that point you could, um, nationalize a relatively simple state of production power, which was already centralized under the kind of capitalist plan. Now we moved, we moved in a very different territory where, where there's this opportunity to, to innovate and be program effectively continuously a uh, robotic production machine to do that we can move converge back to the city. So I think that move move the story centers part and parcel of that. Also then the freeing up of entrepreneurship. So we need to found companies and for that, we also we need, we need finance, we need uh, advice, we need marketing, advertising, we need research, development. So we have the secular uh, development of the decade, last few decades of urban concentration, which basically empties out suburbs back to the cities, smaller cities, into larger cities. It's a global phenomenon. And in that, this, in that kind of context, the old planning of ours is totally overwhelmed and bankrupt. It was never a good idea. Um, and so was any kind of over state match economy. But historically, the big difference it was that idea in the 1950s, but it's not like a suicidal idea in 2000. So we should look at that. And, um, yeah, something like that. Yeah, and then how would, um, you know, let's go back to Adam, how would you think about those ideas, uh, also in the context of a lot of the World Bank or the UN statistics people might say, uh, is that we're growing towards more urban uh, type of people around the world. Um, and so that there's not necessarily a decision that's going to be happening for, for everyone, but it's more so going to happen. And so how does market urbanism uh, fill itself into that necessary demand that's coming? Well, yeah, I think... Um you know, the future is a world of agglomeration. You know, people are going to be moving towards these denser, bigger cities, and that trend, I, I would assume, is going to continue 
Because people want to be around other people. Uh, and, and when you're around other people, uh, ideas flow and bounce off of each other and, and kind of accelerate in that fashion. Uh, and I think the great ideas of the future are going to happen in cities, not on, you know, not in a small town uh, or not in a, you know, a factory near Detroit or something like that. Um, so I want these people in the cities to be in kind of conditions under which productivity is sore, gosh. Then you may have to continuously flop and we tell about the building with this kind of announcement as everything mentioned and the project rather than a stable nine to five routine. In that Google mode you might have nothing to talk about with your neighbors. He's building on this piece and you building on yours and then you 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 you, you like to be undisturbed. And I think we have uh, now everybody feels in their bones that they have to go to the cities because there are no other provinces that we kind of lose try train and uh, will be uh, disconnected their careers from will be that involved. So that pushes everybody to the city and you may be sacrificed. It's all the same as city, right? But it's an existential feeling one has to do with and then one also learns to like one has to do. And people are li- willing to uh, give away up to eight or even more percent of their salary to be in the center, to be part of this network. To be in these breakfast kind of meetings, uh, to, to go from look at the lectures, see, see the events after the communication conferences on the top. They don't participate, they could yes, or something. And uh, that's what I see. So, this, uh, then, yes, you also intuitively want to be part of this, and that becomes a desire, and it also becomes a socioeconomic necessity for an overall. Uh, um, uh, Prosperity engine, which is in the prosperity is that the government's systematic implementing this and blocking this. And so, also the being through zoning, there's only one thing, mobile lens restrictions are part of zoning, but also which can be used to be allocated where, but also standards, <laughs> housing standards, part of large sizes are seen for all apartments, they're interfering with kind of mixed. You know, this is what happens. They want to care for everybody. You know that the market's all on who's actually urgent to require for the city. But then I think that I need that everywhere. Um, in that question, I don't use it very small and more terrible size. Thinking of it, like, but these things are not on the market because we need to protect people from living in rabbit touches until so I'm going to get them. Uh, well, people talk about slums and rabbit touches. Politicians. And we're going to protect. Uh, nobody thanked us because they should prevent people from making black and other chances. Uh, I think that's where, 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 where we have this crisis in which um, that kind of productivity potential and career development potential is on the fast and it's going kind to of draw, draw in and more you can be on any kind of barriers which really prevents the fight and comes in and also uh, the kind of supply should be comprised when it comes in. So you, it's not only that not in the houses, but the apartments are there because it may be too big and the houses are kept too small. But also, and because they're too expensive, they have to be a fixed kind of a pop. You know, there's only a lot of people that have to try it out of that market because the system in 2020 is going to be that low. And that's the same people kind of keep uh, drumming the kind of social justice and help, wanting to help the and be inclusive and want to have everybody a piece of this and want to care for low income people, they are not at the same time prevent uh, affordability of the rest of the market. So there's huge conversations and, and uh, it's a topic you touch with the way I'm coming at it, it's viciously toxic and it's dangerous. And, uh, yeah, I guess. I guess unless you start kind of stepping out together and, and, and giving us sort of protection. And, that rationale gives a chance, but it's been like a, it's a wave of abuse and information that you get in, 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 in Europe and all the Yeah, I guess the other irony is, you know, the, a lot of this uh, restricted mandates from government you know, have an effect not only economical, that, you know, the most productive places in the world aren't allowed to be as productive as they should be, but there's also an environmental drawback or environmental consequences to that. Uh, 
ironically, you know, the left might be arguing for uh, restricting development in places like San Francisco, which is one of the most uh, environmentally friendly places in the world to live. And you think we shouldn't be stopping from people, we shouldn't be stopping people from living in San Francisco where they, they're not going to spend as much on heating, air conditioning, and these things. Well, you know, the more we prevent people from living in San Francisco, uh, the worse that is for the environment, ironically. And also, uh, from the architect's perspective, uh, you know, regarding how the government distorts the market, how does that distort what the architect wants to do and what they have to do? First of all, it's just totally stifles or blocks off any relation to the um, particular um, places like London or the protection of the uh, it also it prevents creativity most on the developer side because you can't allow no uh, product information because everything is rigidly predetermined. Where to build what, how much to build, what exactly the unit pieces or problem pieces are, and then for each comes with a heavy standards. Every rule is predetermined by the way. And every piece of equipment. So it's basically there's very little you can do and shift blocks on the law. When it comes to the kind of communicative expression of this, uh, that's pretty right because in fairness, says this should have fit in with breaks and stuff in windows. Environmental constraints in terms of the one fit all energy kind of policy needs to get kind of small windows and so on. So there's nothing left to do, literally, both for the industry and the architect. And then to learn starts to compete, the map is much worse than here, I guess. We learn only on in the sense negotiating with the, with the authorities because then they have a lot of discretion over their own rules. So in the end, which councils, you know, which planners, you know, in and out, so to get them started, this is kind of messy thing, special knowledge, special interest navigation. That's what you compete on and gaming and playing, uh, uh, you know, buying questions and answer with more because you think you can get beyond certain rules and get special provisions and get navigate. That's what they're competing on, that's what sorts out. That's why it means also that the foreign developers kind of come to the territory, so it becomes very kind of monopolized and strangely or oligopolized because the developer can never enter another city that will go and crash because they don't know how to make mistakes, they can't appreciate the problem sounds to me and what they have to account for cost. So it's basically there's no market in the real estate world. It's, it's very, very heavy. Well, that's why it doesn't much. Um, because it's so politicized and so Indian corrupt. The strange thing is that also, if you look below, you know, below the hood in terms of this idea of inclusiveness and, and, and um, uh, social support for, for residents, even in London, this is a high system which invites a lot of uh, um, suspect practices in this incredibly unfair. And the more you go out to other countries, which are less checks and balances, you get these are all invitations for corruption uh, on round the world. So this is not even that the ideas are bad. And um, I would criticize the even they were uh, viable and doable. And the fact is that the system can't deliver towards these ideas and then you can so it's handling into 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 stagnation and corruption. Relatively speaking, to more Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I guess, uh, you know, I, I guess, on the topic of, of architectural design, you know, I, I love to repeat what, what Stephen often tweets is that architects don't design buildings in New York, zoning does. I mean, in, in a way, is the truth, you know, 90% of what is done when you're looking at what to do with a site is just compliance. It's just complying with the zoning. Once you've figured out a, a program that complies with the zoning, then you make it pretty. But really, it's 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 just you know going through the rule books and seeing what you're allowed to do and build, you know, and, and and then dealing with the planners. Planners, I don't think is the right word anymore because they're not planning; they're reacting. <laughs> um, and, and 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 most of at least as a developer, my interaction with the planning department, they're telling you know they're just acting as petty bureaucrats, they're not saying, we have a vision, 
here's part of the vision, here's how we think your piece of land fits in with that vision, and here's how we see the future of this being. No, it's like, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, um, and that's about it. You know, you can you can fight it with your lawyers, but if they're just, you know, I mean, they spend their time usually at least getting a master's degree in planning, and then they just basically executing the the politicians and neighborhood groups' these desires, basically. <laughs> This is some kind of soft work, and I say, loop to loopholes or vacuums. So, in London, it's very clever where he, he found this loophole of the. Um, where he can offer, get away from these standards. These are the individual humans can't be shared away in the amount of this among us. He took this from a decision which is uh, looked at something where, where, where uh, five, six families <coughs> came around the living room. Uh, he, Push to the 500, first of all, the specific platform. And suddenly, it creates a fantastic cohesion environment. The various more humans that becomes competitive and attracts more crowds. There's also an interesting central government sometimes. It's been seeing the way the Zimbabwe and the localized politics is siphoning everything. And I would at least represent the that you're all around one nation. So that Try to break through some of those uh, rules and get a lot of revised by the contemporary human standards. And then yeah, you can see what the market is looking for. And also, in China, I think there's a lot of examples of, of the true entrepreneurial innovation. Um, sometimes it becomes quite counterintuitive, these results, but they will work. For instance, the national building may have units. Uh, which they leave open and they don't prescribe whether the retail units, office, work units, or residential units. And that's what the whole doing. And it's basically kind of lovely in each other where you can have a uh, hassle on the 15th floor and, and somebody's opening a small restaurant and it's a yellow unit screen. Workspaces. Uh, retail spaces around, and of course they gather more into the ground, the retail zones, and then you have offices which have more and, and customers, they come across the retail. And you get a very interesting and bizarre place after you have the time to you. It's bizarre. And I thought it was lovely and, 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 and vibrant, and also catering to us and, um, you know, work with and start companies, um, that you could do what you can see fit in a piece of property you purchase, and this was called Somo, small home office, and uh, they just made the, the, the entrances and elevators and access, uh, they invested with more of those, and because it's actual, and then you have that, that flourish, I mean, but this was early days, I think they also kind of normalized into, uh, and, and so it is kind of raw entrepreneurial stage and state of, of the commercial country, unfortunately, they can't copy lots of and all the kind of bad ideas, <laughs> gradually importing them into there, and, and these things kind of, these, these lessons couldn't take off. And uh, so that's, that's again, um, and I think uh, the creativity has to start also the entrepreneurs, the developers' creativity, imagining a, a lifestyle and way of this activity, and we can feel it as well. And then this spatial translation to this, and there we have to be able to go under the rules of freedom. And uh, since our hands are tight and we can only do a few things, everybody becomes bored. Uh, the, the profession becomes boring and, and stifling, so that's kind of creative. Um, uh, that's kind of very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of startups, if you would like to uh, discuss your other company, Paraffin. Sure, yeah. Um, well, I guess I have something to add to that real quick. Is just like, yeah, I guess, you know, what I said about, you know, planners, the same thing goes for developers. And they've been trained to be compliance machines, basically. <laughs> so the creativity has been sucked out of both development and planning. You know, as a developer, if you want to be creative, 
well, first find a loophole, basically. If you want to do something, you're not allowed to find, that's the creativity, is just navigating the maze and finding a loophole. Um, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, to get in touch on uh, uh, Paraffin, so yeah, I'm a co-founder of, of Paraffin, which is a artificial intelligence platform that uses generative design and parametric modeling to rapidly generate optimized building design. I guess so to, to, to explain that quickly, uh, um, uh, the process, the current process of a developer working with an architect can take weeks or months where our, you, you, the developer asks the architect to come up with a design for a particular site. Within a few weeks, the architect will come back with, with three designs maybe, and, and then uh, the developer sends them back to the drawing board to make some changes so that it performs better according to their financial model. Uh, and this process can continue for weeks and months. Uh, so what Paraben does is it uh, recreates that process using parametric modeling, but what, on high co- high power computers. So you know, on what used to be several iterations of three designs each, this is millions of designs being generated at a time using a computational uh, modeling techniques. Uh, and and then what happens is. These computa- these parametric designs are uh, then linked to financial models uh, that, just like a developer would use, so that a developer can filter and sort those designs. Say you have a, a million possible or 10 million possible designs for a particular site that the computer generates. Well, then the software will, will make financial models for each of those, so then you can filter and sort which ones you may want to go with. So, you know, instead of waiting weeks for an architect to give you three designs, you wait a few minutes and the software is a million. Um, so, uh, that could help. It's, uh, yeah, for a developer, you know, at least I see it as a, as a potential game, big game changer. So it's, it's um, so the product's been developed. We're in conversations with our first enterprise customers. Uh, so the first version of the product is for hotel buildings, uh, and then we'll branch out into multifamily and other product types. Uh, and uh, so if you want to talk to me about that, or or you know the rest of the paraffin team is here as well. Uh, we'll have, have to talk about that after. Yeah. Hello. Some of the inspiration is, is what you know your firm probably does with generative design and, and uh, genetic algorithms, where you would be looking at uh, a million different ways to optimize a building for sunlight, solar radiation, environmental factors, and things like that. But we said, well, that's these are all important variables to a building's design. Uh, but ultimately, what matters to the developer is creating value. So it's, it's, trying, it's using those same techniques to do uh, uh, an uh, research project which works on another aspect, which isn't geared up to things like hotels, where it's going to be simple uh, accumulation of rules uh, for core buildings, uh, for, for core campuses. And, they bring people together, uh, hundreds and then thousands, and uh, try to simulate uh, interaction patterns between diversified crowds and how they would use the space and, and, and what kind of counter frequencies, how they depend on the distribution of meeting zones, entrance, and social spaces. Uh, so that also would, would mean that uh, we have a complex. Simulation of social functionality aspects, which um, I think critical and crucial, we then would translate into a value proposition for these companies. Also, I think that is um, kind of integrated and so on, but it doesn't small scale. So, that's, that's fascinating that we can finally, through computational revolution, we can make trackable and operational 
uh, more complex utility phrases than the other ones to rely on. But what we're talking about is, uh, what I'm talking about here, what we can do anymore. Uh, yeah, so I was going to say, <laughs> for, for centuries we've been relying on intuition, you know, both the architect and the developer. Developer thinking, oh, I think I can make this money on this site. The architect saying, this is going to work great. People are going to walk over here. Well, you know, like there's, you know, that, that's an intuition. Let's test it, you know, using computational techniques. And you know, I think that's definitely the, the future of how cities will will, will synergize and, and and the spaces within buildings and how buildings interact together. So, yeah, I think that's you know that's that's definitely where we need to go. Yeah, can you please speak to more of uh, what you were mentioning earlier about the post eras of architecture and how uh, you know this kind of dynamic is carrying up for the future era, which you have described as great length. Yeah, I mean, uh, what I found important is look at the city, the shape of the city, and this idea of conversions that come together, and how it's also kind of challenges the space possibilities. Uh, we actually love that kind of involvement of chaos and blindness and diversity and mixity of uses clustering together, um, uh, which happens even despite the <coughs> trying to keep it kind of simple and cleanly ordered and so on. Uh, so, so I'm fascinated by that, and I think it was incredibly important is to have a total freedom to entrepreneurs to go around and see the sites which they think will work for them. What I mean is that the city is all about coming together for the reason of connecting up with networking of network synergetic activities. So it's a team of these synergies that you have to be free to locate and look at the site and see what's there and what kind of problems could fit in and make the best use of this particular location and all the other uses to calibrate that. And it needs to be really relatively free to do this. And in terms of the architecture, you get something very kind of complex and intricate. I'm thinking about how I want to develop a repertoire and vocabulary of architecture, which can express all these affiliations, these embedding of buildings into synergy networks, and to express the building which other elements of the building are that connect up to and responds to and belongs to. Uh, this could be immediate thing most, but also further aspects to make it uh, uh, legible and malleable for users. So we have, on one hand, I'm talking about the uh, freedom of uh, all the users, entrepreneurs, and their customers to self organize and become their energy networks in the city. Uh, but I think it's really freedom and not be arbitrary pushed into various parts and then. The whole point of coming together is part is content, but then also to, as an architectural task, it challenges us as architects to give shape to this and expression, but also expression in a way that uh, we can find each other and find the various places in this network. So it's really kind of articulation task. So these kind of problems we can work on um, in schools of architecture, research labs. You know, research tools and so develop those oftentimes mixed use complexes, even though they're compromised in the United States. But then in other countries, you get more years of people, you can start trying this. Mm -hmm. But it points to very, very different set, uh, very different, much more organic, much more dense um, uh, city, which isn't a city of separate blocks and cells, which are sliced up into separate floors and, and, and four rooms. But something which is very open, so it always, in my view, and vision and architecture become more and more hollow in the visibility and the awareness, so that I'm exposed to some native of other activities which might be relevant to me and connect up to. You can see a little bit of aging and so on, and, 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 and you know, especially in the urban space, all the players in the street space. And so this is a very different idea. Maybe also multiple levels of network and connections. So really connect, 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 network, 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 as well. We have this kind of vision of something very, very exciting and dense and, and, and organic because we need all to do this freedom. We can't arrange this only on a kind of grid and orthogonal um, basis. So there's, there's, there's implications for 
forbid from his own me and and style on the issue of the problem. And there we also unfortunately we have a conservatism and regressiveness possibility that uh, we are now having in this sort of kind of poses which are drawn up and, and proselytized uh, eight years ago would have exactly the same. We could have had also this if nothing's coming through. Uh, we had a kind of conservative backlash there as well. Um, but so um, under this in, in the schools, in various arenas of research, something new is emerging, which um, I hope that this will, will come to flourish more at the end. It's the least of him to bring that out. Yeah. yeah, I think it's, I mean, it, the way you were describing how you think uh, a city and has its synergies and multiple layers of complexity, like a, uh, what keeps coming to mind is like a, a forest or a rainforest. It's almost it's an unplanned <laughs> order where there's synergy between the plants, animals, and, and nature. Um, and this is, in a way, what a, what a city is. It, would, it could become uh, with all these arbitrary infringements or the back of the discipline with kind of um, a blunt and uh, restricted repertoire. This really could be a bottom up order which will, which will be given back to see a sense of identity and coherence and unique identities because it will be half dependent, it will be evolved by different values and different. But now the strategy in the way that nobody likes it, the carnival environment is what I call a garbage organization. The planners trying to restrict and they do their bit, but in the end, if you look back at the city, nobody can imagine it's just bad. It's a raw uh, agglomeration. And that's the problem I work on. Nobody likes it because it seems like everywhere is the same. Cities in the Middle East and Asia and in South America and in America. There's always kind of strange random spill. So, on the one hand, we, we love the degrees of freedom and the prestige, which is in there, but the professionals get to learn and be set free to give that a human shape very much similar. And I also use a metaphor of kind of multi species ecology of the jungle. You go out of landscapes where you have without um, the central plan. In fact, the bottom up who evolves energetic ecology, which generates character and, and also order of sorts, because it's a rule based. Um, um, nothing is going to happen in this room, but they have good reasons. Seems yeah. random, but, no. but everything's there for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but these reasons also need to be in the incentives and motivating uh, forces need to be allowed to pull through and get shape, and then there will be a uh, sense of things. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> so, I think it's time for Yeah. Let us uh, yeah, let's begin with the questions. Can everyone please make sure to uh, talk loudly for all our guests uh, here and on the live stream as well? So let's start with you back there. Thank you. Uh, Eric Bremen, we got Patrick. Uh, question um, with regards to this organic approach to the planning and zoning. Uh, clearly, we're talking about zoning and planning in the hands of bureaucrats and government officials that have a fundamental mismatch of alignment of incentives. Got it. How about, however, in the context of a private city scale developer? Where to some extent, just as you know, the theory of the firm and several other ways of looking at organization, there's a clear argument to be made that if you have the right incentives, it's totally okay and in fact optimal for some initial planning to take place. So that the issue is not so much that planning is bad, you shouldn't plan, period, but that who's doing the planning, what's their incentive structure, and are they flexible after they create an initial plan so as to like, let the market do its thing. Um, you know, and, and, and the alternative being that there's no plan and then the, 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 uh, cost of starting for any one party that has the idea of a building is much higher because they have to visualize not only the building, but what might emerge around them. So could you comment on how you balance those two things? And am I correct to say that zoning and planning is not bad universally just because, but depending on the hands of whom you're thinking about? Thank you. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think the, I think, I think you kind of said it. 
I think you, you said everything yourself <laughs> in a way. <laughs> uh, but and uh, I have one historical example. Which I'm I'm talking about private banking. Actually, also I started lecturing at my hand on three months ago, and um, planning is easy. yeah. Private family and high income of the old family. And then I'm very scared of basic degrees. And a good example here is um, the way land was developed originally in the 18th and 19th century. Soon the great sort of great estates, where which were trusted families with land holdings, and um, they kind of accumulated and managed an overall value proposition and setting up. Uh, selling land not only free but with covenants and restrictions and protection of the leasehold that these 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 decided these to fall back to make to try to create a moral value because that's fully really legitimate and very useful. Uh, and the question is can you do it from all the city wants the right brain? And my view is that um, that how does itself come to be experimented with. I, I believe also that sometimes those uh, curation ventures need to go by something. So if you have somewhere zones which are far less curation or no curation in, you can you have know, more kind of small brain accumulation and you can start organization. That might give you an idea about then what and how to curate and what works and what doesn't work. So there's various scales of experiments because of course if you have multiple medium sized or large scale and the planners, they would compete with each other. That might not, they still might all have preconceived notions. And therefore, sometimes I think those things would have no value. And we have, we have some of these vacuums, like in India, where the city can totally build up and relatively large chunks. And now we also have a tendency that developers are becoming more and more large chunks because they want to synergize the value proposition they want to. Their investment, what they see, they want to down and buy more and more. I understand all this is all, but I still would want for the idea of um, that you could actually, what you don't know, when you're planning a whole city, you can only try to copy something you've seen, but uh, the same thing you should also allow for something new to emerge, um, and maybe also through, through, through something maybe more anarchic and chaotic. So yeah, cleaned up and and, and cure the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was saying. Yeah, plan, planning has to happen at various levels. Basically, you know, we can plan. You know, let's build a treehouse together and plan it. Uh, you know, up to a scale of an entire city. If you're going, and and there can be synergies that are identified with larger scale plans. But I guess, for example, a shopping mall, you might subsidize your anchor tenant so that you can charge your other tenants more. There's that synergy that the the that private developer is is putting together. Um, it just it, it becomes a thing where like you two things need to happen. One, you, you need to have flexibility in the long run. If forever you're say if you're gonna stand by your plan forever and never, you know, deviate from it one bit, <laughs> you know, you're nothing's gonna Good is going to come out of it. You have to have that versatility, uh, and and part of that is, you know, I guess the second thing is that you have to, if you're going to do large scale planning, you have to have the humility to understand that cities, no matter how much you want to plan it, are emergent order. Uh, so you can try to plan all you want, but some things going to emerge that you didn't plan. Uh, so you got to have that flexibility. And if you're very mindful of the most of the time, continuously. Change to useful. You, you, you look forward to some kind of assumption, that's not necessary. But most probably after 10 iterations, you can use some of the So it becomes a direct deal. Mm -hmm. Alright, let's go there. Uh, and two, two, two part question. Um, with you on the less zoning or less reactive zoning. Um, but at the same time, um, should we get the government out of the business of insuring risky lending? to temper some of the extremes that may take place or riskier construction. And two, don't you also need to understand how the environment is density helps the environment in some respects that you mentioned. But also wouldn't we need to restrict building on um, say watersheds that help support that get water to sit in turn. 
Yeah, I think, I think you know, part of the big reason for the financial crisis in 2008 is because in the past, we would prevent these large institutions that should have failed from failing, you know. Uh, you know, these, these companies, these big banks should have failed, and uh, I don't know if there's much more to say about that. I, I mean, I think there's, as far as building on watershed and other environmentally sensitive areas, I think that I think there's plenty of you know, justification for that. It's just a matter of how to do it, um, whether you do it with a heavy hand of the government or some other mechanism. I mean, I mean, it, I mean I'm in favor of. Not building in a watershed or you know, water well, source. You imagine the scenario, I mean, you're not in that scenario, but if you had a scenario where everything was privatized and um, those owners of the water bodies, which would be considered to kill the kind of benefit downstream, which they could maybe draw on and monetize. Right. So I think this will be started regulating, of course, there are also degrees in particular urban land, there are degrees of collective action necessity, which and I wouldn't give it to the general public, which is you know, a little informed and subject of the uh, demagogy, but it would be landlords who come together uh, and self regulate aspects which concerns them all. So it becomes kind of so like shareholders, and you would go in, the, uh, in a certain district, and of course, the transaction costs bring them together, but imagine a society which has evolved for a while under the least of freedom. You will still have collect, you know, you have within, I don't know, within one holding, but if you have multiple holdings to regulate interferences and mutual value kind of infringements, they could also come together uh, and don't necessarily need the government of this to then kind of divert this. So I believe there could be some kind of land owner democracy because land owners would disrespect and, and, and property owners would represent the interest of all the customers, potential customers, and then the general public in an expert, uh, informed fashion. Because their profit is uh, representing the fact that their general <coughs> value and consumer surplus in their terms is more part of that. And so we need to um, um, look at the, the, the environment is complex, <coughs> and there's a lot of externalities. And some collective action requirements, which is the fact that there's more, it's more politicized, there's more regulation, and more government interference than in the fashion industry. Um, but nevertheless, I believe there are extraordinary and market solutions. So, yeah, I have a question for both of you. What's the easiest and most difficult city you've ever worked in, and why? <laughs> I, you know, I've, as a developer, I've worked in <laughs> two cities and, and, you know, witnessed another, you know, as a student. But, you know, so I've worked in, in New York and Chicago as a developer and studied real estate development in the Boston area. I would think, actually, you know, Cambridge, Massachusetts is a, is a lot more difficult than New York. Uh, but New York is pretty bad. <laughs> uh, Chicago, in comparison, New York is a free market paradise, but it's, <laughs> far, from, it's far from it, you know, in reality. Uh, but you know, those are my three anecdotes. <laughs> well, to some extent, yeah, just like the, you know, the, the more dense, the more sure, and wealthy um, place, it creates all difficulties to set up many thoughts, everything, everything, so so many spaces. Slower, um, and also you would, to some extent, should because when you, when you come into a very complex high density, uh, high value um, the context of a new piece, you have to be sensitive to what you're doing and potentially dispose of. So, so, so something that not is inherently hard to do, but it's made immensely and more difficult to the to, to, to restrictions and politicization. And the amount of value just destroys through the things not happening is kind of shocking. You know, they have developed some last five years of planning and, and bring something forward very, very uh, well developed with so many iterations of planning and models and so on. And it's just that rejected or postponed or cancelled. We also have some projects where, in, you know, for two years we go around in circles with these kind of gaming with planners 
and the, the affordability quotas and bilingual sugar and other work conditions. So you, 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 the design becomes also a play. You show them more, build the volume, because you want some more and a software you know, so this kind of gaming and, and negotiation and buffing takes the end of all of that. It's incredibly bad in my delivery. And the amount of um uh let's say the land value as a percentage of GDP has shot up from fifty percent to two hundred percent in the UK. And of course the, the actual ground is it's all in the in the Value of what planning adds, so that the, the cost and value of having a sleep planning, so the clinical process, is a huge, huge amount of value, which, 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 um, a long way into, into, you know, double or, or, um, GDP of that country. And, um, it makes very little difference. So that is one of the worst ones that we got very little done there. So we, 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 well, in your London projects, what's the longest time one of your projects has been tied up in entitlements? Well, we have any projects that are this Or what in all your projects? For years, a few years ago, I mean, so I mean, other countries we have problems, uh, it's really school, you know, so they, they, they uh, so we can build a lot of government projects, but the government changed for 10 times to make a great process. So it should have taken three or four years to put me in the evidence. Oh. <laughs> I guess my worst is just been ten years or something. Oh, I didn't go. You want to hear about all that? Yeah. Yeah, that's part of that. Yes. Uh, I'm curious if any of you are familiar with the state senator from California, Scott Weiner's plan for three plans. Uh, it's kind of the only game he has to out there. It's actually a pretty radical plan to supersede local housing restrictions around transit in the very least. But I mean, it, it seems that the likely resistance or the resistance he is getting is less, it's like boogeyman bureaucracy and more about the homeowners. And to some degree, you touched on it too, it's the, the incumbent developers that fail out of game that system to have an incentive for the status quo. You know, what is the, the market urbanist answer to removing the power of homeowners that effectively do create a lot of these zoning restrictions? That are not sort of nebulously created from bureaucracy, it's to protect the sort of home corner. I think more or less everything I've seen in that bill uh, is awesome. It's great. Uh, it basically, basically, to explain it, uh, that bill it was 823 or 827, uh, something like that. Um, and, and what this legislation does in the state of California, if you're a certain radius from a transit stop, you, the, Local government cannot impose height limits below a certain amount. They cannot impose density restrictions. They cannot impose a lot of the things that are preventing. So basically, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's market urbanism in, a, in transit locations. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm all for it. We'll see if it gets passed. Um, but even if it doesn't, it's opening up a, a good dialogue that, hey, you know, why, why are we preventing people from living in in transit served locations? Because there's incumbent homeowners that you know, don't like it. So I I'm in favor. Yeah, we do. I mean, um, I don't think yeah, the homeowners should necessarily have this power to prevent um, um, development of the whole area, which is I don't like it. It's just that uh, yes, I mean there's. There's no fast and ready formula how to, how to, uh, what is an, defines an infringement on somebody's property, but somebody building something else in, in this case, um, which doesn't really affect, there's no kind of affects the feeling and the nature of what he's called, it's a while ago. There's too much of protection of somebody's property. So also in the market, you, you don't say, uh, you prevent somebody, um, um, from, from opening the forum to compete with you, because certain countries are not going to do that. So, it's not a tough time. If you have these kind of rules of protecting everybody from any anything which are not going to be able to hold that nation. So, we have to have a political debate about the kind of rules uh, 
those things to those issues and to us. Yeah. Um, just two questions. One um, incredibly fascinating discussion. Thank you for bringing up both the LA example and also the European example. Um, just to shortcut my reading, can you recommend any good writers or articles who have talked about the issue in Europe? Uh, that's the first question. Second one is um, such an irony because so many European uh, cities appear uh, to Americans as uh, you know kind of new urbanist paradises, and you're always hearing about such and such city going green, you know, Copenhagen and you know, it's how green these cities are. Um, do you consider you know green these cities going green? Is this another layer of, of regulation, or does it help in any way to further the main goals of the city, which is this you know this, the interaction with the people? Well, it's partly problematic, I think. Uh, what I object to is is the one fit all rule of energy conservation. So you impose that instability on every new building. Um, and I think that makes no sense to ask you to do certain high performance hubs in a full campus somewhere where you want to have a lot of open transparency and, and, and that could empower a lot of prosperity engine. They now have to also kind of shut down and, and, and close walls and small windows. And, and um, I think that, that that should not happen. I think the, the incentive to, to save energy should be, should be in the market, there should be energy subsidies. And I uh, believe things like carbon trading as an interim. Uh, but in the build environment, we have this kind of one fits all rules you can kind of counter certain rules of problem. Otherwise, in terms of, uh, um, um, I don't know, various green policy that we even have to even uh, work in the moment on uh, something I published in, in England and in London as to what walkability of, of cities and um, destination efforts and the network of walkability and shorts should go together with the densification and we need to push and we really use all the streets as most for walking. Um, yeah. it's, it's very hard. You know, it, that's why I think I can imagine this kind of greening would be strategic and could work congenial to a privatization network because a lot of private developers love that escalation in areas and put that very space side of the best and so squeeze out the cars quite quickly. And at the same time, would incentivize such a alternatives. But of course, we also realize that there are network effects, so we um, uh, still have some kind of form of collective action underlying this. Um, but the, the, the current political process with respect to such an issue is, is, is very, very slow. We have to wait for, for decades. <laughs> and we don't have that. Yeah, I guess, I guess uh, I just quickly, I guess. Um, I think if government is going to talk about the environment, it, it should start by s stopping doing the things that they're doing that's hurting the environment. You know, first stop doing wrong, then figure, then start telling other people what to do. Uh, you know, so stop subsidizing the automobile, stop building all these damn highways, stop, well, I mean, it's another topic, but war, you know, all these things. Um, you know. Before you tell someone else what to do, you you got to have virtue yourself, and so I think I'd like to see the government, you know, get its act together first. Mm -hmm. All right, we have time for one more uh, question, I believe. So uh, let's go with yes, you right there. Hudson County, New Jersey, has half a million people in a rather high population density. What prevents it from being the core of an independent city as opposed to a bedroom community that sends commuters to Manhattan? What, what prevents it? Well, I mean, I mean, I guess there's a few reasons. I, I'm not an expert in Hudson, Hudson County, but I would suspect, you know, first of all, it doesn't have the agglomeration that Manhattan does, you know. Um, but, you know, I'd have to look at the zoning policies in the area that may prevent people from creating new agglomeration economies in Hudson County. Sorry, that is probably not like the best answer. That's, you know, 
comes to my mind. Yeah. 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 Sure. Mine's part question, part suggestion for everybody here, because the title is Startup Cities, and obviously it presupposes cities getting started. <laughs> and, uh, and so the first question is, how many of you here in the audience have actually attempted to start a city? <laughs> there you go, okay. Well, Community. I just want to invite you all to, when you go home, in your home state, Learn about what it takes to incorporate a city. You'll be interested to see that it's actually not as hard as you might think. And that if you were to incorporate a city, you would actually be able to set up a planning and zoning board. Not that you should exercise such power in exactly the way these gentlemen are set up to do so. But you could, and we've looked at this, with the hand of a handful of crafty lawyers, craft such planning boards in a way that is a lot more friendly to the ideas that have been presented here. So to those of you who might turn these types of conversations into being inspired to be a city for a neuron. Question to the panel is, what sorts of things should they be looking at when considering starting a city either from scratch or within a city or proximate to a city that, in your opinion, would make it most suitable to actually have a fighting chance to be successful? I mean, I, I guess the first question is why? Why you have to be able to answer the question why are you starting a city? And, and I can't answer that for someone, but you know you have to have a good reason why people are going to come together, how people are going to have synergies together, how people are going to you know work together to create something that better than some of their parts. So I, I mean, I guess I although. You know, my path down here started as kind of this grand visionary that we could create cities from scratch. I've become a little more skeptical or, or maybe just humble that, you know, that we could or should be starting cities from scratch. I think like, okay, we'll start small, you know, start with something that works, start with a, you know, economic reason, some, uh, economic reason why people need to come together, or people who want to come together. Let them come together around that idea. Well, I think that, that, that also this project, so, so think about the cities, this kind of um, concept, take a scale down the line, and uh, the reason why they start a new city is because it's not only a new city, it's a new society, it's a new civilian project of more free uh, entrepreneurial and market driven society. And unfortunately, this is all the past society in different centers in which cities are all politically kind of captured. They have to go to public places and she starts to stretch. You wouldn't do that. And uh, if it wasn't for the lack of ability to to, to have a free society in existing cities. It's all uh, so right. you usually don't step in everybody's foot. Having said that, so how do you then start? Uh, well, I think at the same time since the whole world is so and politically um, stifled. Once you start somewhere, there's this additional incentive for every free enterprise or every drawing people to there, even though it's not ideal because you can start from scratch, there's the advantages of risk freedom. So that makes it very viable to do that. Once you, so that's the scenario of it. So very, very free societies, um, it's actually a society of entrepreneurship, often a social contract, and that also it's not only uh, <laughs> corporate and kind of planning rules, but in terms of some past societal rules. Uh, and we'll be buying into and moving such things. But on the urban level, I would try to learn from what I said earlier about in these villages that we try and bring on those functions, cluster in which, in which, on which floor, on which kind of rooms. The same with the urban level, I would try to avoid any zoning with respect to nature. Functions because we're no longer living in that revolution where we have actually physical, polluting, noisy, and, and, and uh, production in the city. Now we're just talking about this. Uh, it's the only thing that will exclude from zoning area, but um, I would not be otherwise respectful about the, you know, that there's residential detail, office space, workspaces, cultural spaces. Uh, I wouldn't be too restrictive there in terms of. You have to see some plan, but then you can make a speculation and buy somebody into um, um, something and you, you might. But the very big thing I would avoid uh, zoning, and um, you could have 
maybe some kind of uh, sounding board of, of, of um, advising, but uh, I think I would, I would try to initially anyway try out as much freedom as possible and be not paranoid about freedom and what could call it. That's what I mean, a lot of people have found. They're so scared of giving up people freedom because they're all so if bad things happen, yeah, then I can learn from that. I would say let's risk more degrees of freedom in general society, but also in the scenario of the privacy. And that's a fascinating case study uh, for the audience as well. Uh, when that connotation comes up, you often think of uh, very stimulating futuristic cities, uh, you know, a lot of optimism about what the future holds. Uh, to go back in the past a little bit on that topic, uh, the largest tax contributor in Florida, uh, Greenwell, was actually a startup city. It's a really interesting to look into the dynamic of how they uh, bought the land, worked with the state, and developed legal systems that were customized for themselves, uh, and that goes hand in hand with zoning regulations and building code that was all tailored fit uh, as they were building Disney World. Uh, yeah, and so you can see how they developed their system of building out their park, uh, everything from the, you know, standard commercial pathways and roads that the normal visitors go on to the, uh, you know, really intricate infrastructure and back roads and systems that go along with that. So, uh, while Projects like maybe some floating islands out in the Pacific Ocean are uh, wonderful to look at and, and hold a good bar to reach. Uh, there's plenty of examples in the past that we can go back to and, uh, and find incredible evidence. Uh, yeah, so with that being said, great question to end it. Uh, I would like to give uh, each of you time to talk about where people can follow up with you, contact you, if you have any other announcements. Sure. Uh, yeah, marketurbanism.com. Uh, also on Twitter at marketurbanism. We're, we have a Facebook page and a pretty active Facebook group. Uh, I'd like to see all of you on the Facebook group and, and join the conversation. Uh, I guess as far as announcements go, I, I haven't been too vocal about you know some of the market urban, recent market urbanism announcements. We have um, formed a, a nonprofit organization. Center for Market Urbanism. Uh, we're going to be in, in the future announcing some some projects, uh, both academic and policy projects, which Nolan Gray is going to be heading up as our uh, head of policy and research. Uh, we're going to be having some events, uh, and we're and, including FECON uh, this summer in Atlanta, which actually Pat Patrick recently uh, agreed to participate in. And it'll be kind of a keynote of the market urbanism track, which will be six uh, sessions at, in Atlanta there uh, throughout the whole, the whole weekend. Uh, uh, yeah, so there's yeah the, the policy work events, and we're going to continue to uh, write at marketurbanism.com, create new media, including uh, videos and things like that, as well as... Uh, no, no one was working on a, a collaborative book project about uh, summarizing a lot of the policies of, of market urban. Um, yeah, I think that covers it. Well, so I'm actually giving a lecture tomorrow in town at the National Arts Club. So, eight o'clock, and you can find it on my Facebook site. Details of this, uh, very close to me somewhere. And I don't talk about Architecture and social societal progress. I'm um, talking about the good environment as well as social processes, the city as a text, system of simplification, etc. Um, otherwise, yeah, my uh, website, uh, my Facebook page, uh, there's tons of presentations on YouTube there. Um, you can find those things on my website that I'm talking about. Um, urbanism. Urbanism, but also illustrate uh, this world of visuals, the history of urban development to various stages of social economic development, to various styles, and where we are now, and where we can hope you could go with some visionary projects, party, and arts, which we can learn from our urban plans. So there's tons of stuff on, on YouTube, and soon we can find 
textures, clips, visuals, and so on and so Great, great. Well, that being said, uh, you can find Startup Cities at startupcities.co. All our contact information is there. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter, that is also there. Um, make sure to use the hashtag Startup Cities. If you have any photos, or any tweet, any quotes, that'd be much appreciated. And uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, stimulating discussion of uh, very great ideas. Uh, feel free to finish off the food and drinks that are left and socialize among yourselves. Once again, thank you very much and a round of applause for you. All right, that was Startup Cities, hosted by Peter Ryan, featuring Patrick Schumacher, head of Zaha Hadid Architects, and Adam Hangels, founder of Market Urbanism. So, Joe, what was your take on the, on the discussion? Well, first of all, I'm jealous that you get to go to all these things. <laughs> well, I'm just stuck here in Australia where nothing interesting ever happens. <laughs> <laughs> We got to get you to sign up for the Free State Project to move back to New Hampshire. Yeah, <laughs> I want to start a Free State Project down here in South Australia. <laughs> I think it's a bit of a long shot, though. It'll be a Free State of one. <laughs> Although I could see Western Australia seceding at some point if they know it's good for them. <laughs> was there anything that that really jumped out at you in this discussion? Well, I was already familiar with a lot of Patrick's views, you know, from our previous episodes, and having read a lot of the market urbanism stuff, I was familiar with a lot of the points that Adam made as well. One point that I hadn't really thought of before was just how much of an impact this sort of market urbanism philosophy has had on the broader urbanism movement. It does seem like it's really making some waves and that a lot of people are coming on board with the idea that if you want affordable housing, you have to allow affordable housing to be built. Yeah, and not just affordable housing, but you know, mixed-use development, entrepreneurship within cities, the creation of businesses, small businesses within neighborhoods. These are things that everybody likes and everybody wants. Unless you're in some suburban backwater, surrounded by nothing but other houses that look exactly like yours, <laughs> most people would love to have some walkability to amenities like restaurants and shops and parks. And having a mix of uses is something that zoning and planning officials have worked really hard over the last 50 to even almost 100 years to try to prevent. <laughs> so yeah, I think that planners are starting to wake up and realize that a lot of planners have been doing a lot of really bad things for a really long time for all the wrong reasons. And it's time to get out of the way and let cities become what cities should be, which is vibrant, dense, mixed use, to some extent unpredictable, and, and Patrick even used the word chaotic, places where lots of different things can happen, where you can have unexpected synergies emerging between various uses and various adjacencies. Yeah, I think that is becoming a trend, and I think that market urbanism is playing a really important role in promoting that. I was also fascinated by Adam's discussion of the paraffin software. I've been reading up a little bit about AI and neural networks, and I even took my household budget estimating spreadsheet and built a little neural network into that <laughs> so that it can automatically categorize all my expenditures. Then does it talk to you and make you feel bad about how, mu how much money you're not saving? <laughs> Time to start eating rice and beans, Joe. <laughs> One weird thing that happened, I noticed that it had renamed the category from food to Fuel for obsolete sack of decaying flesh. <laughs> yeah, so my household budgeting estimate spreadsheet has become self-aware. <laughs> so the first pass that I ran with this thing, it had a little bit of a bug in it where it assigned probably 80% of my transactions to the parking category. <laughs> so apparently the AI I created is capable of writing modern zoning ordinances with minimum parking requirements. <laughs> <laughs> Building on that experience, I do want to try to take on some other AI projects. And after editing this recording, I think my first and foremost target is going to be a better audio noise reduction software. <laughs> yeah, too little too late on that one. But paraffin is so interesting because you think of architecture as such a complex discipline and a complex series of tasks that you need to do to get even these preliminary designs off the ground that it's kind of amazing that the software generates so many designs so quickly, along with all the costings and everything. It sounds like you're the one who's going to be obsolete pretty soon, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I think that happened a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I got to talk with Adam as well as a couple of the other developers working with him on that project. 
after the event and it does sound really interesting it sounds like they've really put together something something pretty unique here that could be really valuable to developers i think at least at this point it seems like something that's more geared towards probably kind of bigger developments and developments that are really cost driven or maybe not cost driven but profit driven right which of course many projects are but Something like like multi-unit residential development, they mentioned that they're working in hospitality, hotels, you know, developing kind of the math of how many hotel rooms should we build, how many apartments should we build, and what are the returns on investment given some of those input variables. So I think that for some project types like that, this could really be a game changer. Um, but of course, there are other project types, like again, my background is in healthcare design. The, the types of healthcare projects I've worked on are less driven by those financial returns and more driven by programmatic need or, or to some extent demographics or the hospital's prediction of their patient loads and case types and all those kinds of things. You could certainly see those things being put into a system like this. But I think that there are probably certain types of projects or types of development and even certain phases of development very early in the, in the programming and planning process where this tool could be really effective. And then from there, an architect might take over and develop that into a truly architectural design. And then I guess that's where Patrick comes in with Zahadid Architects and all of the computational design that they do, you know, where they're taking the programmatic elements that a developer has decided to build and then turning that into a formal arrangement and a building design, in their case, using various parameters about the site and the program to generate the physical shape and form of the architecture, not just the three-dimensional programmatic layout. Yeah, I'm sure Patrick and Adam could probably spend two hours just discussing some of this parametric design stuff. Yeah, it seemed like Patrick's eyes kind of lit up when, uh, when Adam was talking about uh, paraffin and what, what they were doing with it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely right up his alley. I thought there were a few uh, good one-liners here throughout the discussion. Were there any that jumped out at you there? Yeah, Adam had a few good lines about how planners and designers don't plan and design. They mainly just have to figure out how to comply with the various codes and standards. Right, he said they're not planning, they're reacting. Yeah. And then to be creative, <laughs> to be creative, you have to find a loophole. Right. Yeah. The creativity isn't in developing the project. It's in being creative with the code and the way that you apply the code and then the planning regulations and in trying to find a way around that. Yeah. Patrick had made a good point there that it's not just a problem that, you know, you have substandard development because creativity has been removed from the task of entrepreneurs and architects and designers. But when the creativity and development comes in, as he calls it, gaming the planners, mm. right? When they're, they're just negotiating with the authorities, that that becomes an invitation for corruption. If your task as a developer is to get the authorities on your side supporting your project, I mean, you can see that opens the door to all kinds of bad things, especially, you know, maybe in less developed nations where they have less checks and balances on the powers of these planners and less consequences for regulators who are on the take. Yeah, and the fact that the government plays such an important role in these projects can have serious consequences. I think Patrick's comment about the, the project that took 11 years because the government changed 10 <laughs> times <I know. laughs> during the course of the project is pretty illustrative of just why governments shouldn't be involved in this stuff in the first place. Yeah, and you know, when you have that kind of turnover in these regulatory systems, you have the situation where you have these planning rules that are very rigid and kind of unchanging over time. And yet when it comes to actually trying to apply those rules, it's totally unpredictable because the process doesn't depend on the rules. It depends on the planners who are enforcing those rules. You know, and that can be, you know, again, it's not rule of law, it's, it's rule of men. You're at the mercy of these people who think they know best and will apply the planning regulations when it serves their purposes or agrees with their own personal beliefs of how the city should be planned. But there can be a lot of wiggle room in these planning codes. But the way that you take advantage of that is by taking advantage of the planners themselves. These regulators have a lot of power to say what can or can't be done. And, and as Adam said, you know, a lot of times they're just responding to the NIMBY crowd, you know, not in my backyard, of established incumbent homeowners and property owners within a given area to prevent any new development from coming in. There was a good question there where they talked about what role or what rights should incumbent homeowners have to prevent some kind of development in their neighborhood? As Patrick said, and I'm rewording this, but your property rights, when you own a piece of property, don't include the ability to control your neighbor's property, right? Your neighbor can't control your property. 
and you can't control your neighbor's property other than, as Patrick said, to mitigate some kind of negative externality. You know, if there's a steel plant getting built next to your house and they're spewing soot into the air and polluting your yard, then yeah, you can try to mitigate that. And, you know, there can be a tort process or something to try to achieve that. But this idea that homeowners in a given area own their street or own their neighborhood or own their city, I see as an infringement on property rights other than to mitigate some kind of negative impacts to their own property rights from adjacent properties. Of course, we've talked about privatizing some of these public spaces, such as roads and other adjacent properties. So if that were to happen, then you could argue that those homeowners would be able to determine what goes on in their neighborhood. But as it stands today, that's just not the case. And while private ownership of these public spaces would actually give these NIMBY types more power to prevent certain developments from happening in their neighborhood, it would also mean that they're bearing the full cost to maintain those public spaces. And so this would provide a financial incentive to them to bring more people into their neighborhoods in order to share that cost burden of maintaining those spaces and assets. Now, this doesn't mean that every neighborhood would suddenly start upzoning from single-family homes into three- and four-story condo developments, but it imposes a real cost for nimbyism. Yeah, you're, you're essentially talking about homeowners associations where when a development is created, the developer or the initial group of homeowners get together and can establish covenants that govern what can be built on each of the properties and all kinds of other restrictions similar to zoning. In fact, from my experience, when I've worked on projects in covenant neighborhoods, often the covenants are much stricter than any zoning code. <laughs> yeah. Or it's not just that they're saying you can only have a single family house on, on your property, but it's saying you can only have a single family house and the maximum square footage is, you know, 4,000 square feet and the minimum square footage is 2,000 square feet and it has to be in you know one of these styles and they some of them even have like style guides with them with <laughs> with drawings of different building types. Yeah, no gnomes on your front lawn. Yeah, all that stuff. That's of course the irony of private ownership is that sometimes these things can be more restrictive than what they are with something like zoning regulations. But as you said, when that happens, those effects are limited to these small pockets of development rather than being applied to everybody within a broad area and also without being applied to existing properties, although it is possible for existing homeowners to join one of these homeowners associations and retroactively put covenants on their own property. Right, but these covenants and decisions that these homeowners associations make have a financial cost that ultimately those homeowners have to bear. So when I bought my townhouse in New Hampshire, one of the reasons I chose the one I did was that they had some of the lowest condo fees of the various developments that I had looked at. And the main reason for that was that it was a large development that had a lot of units in there. And so the cost for the roads and the sewers and the landscaping and all that was spread across a large number of people. So lower condo fees, which can be achieved by densification, can contribute to higher individual property values within a development. And there's another effect, which is probably a bit more limited in its potential application. So in the world of private ownership that we envision, you'd have other services such as transit that would be looking to service some of these neighborhoods. And if they're evaluating which neighborhoods they want to put a new stop in for a high-speed rail or a bus service or something like that, then a more dense neighborhood is going to be much more attractive to them than a less dense one. And likewise, for any retail or other stores that are looking for neighborhoods to build in, they're going to want to be located in high-density areas as well. So I think this sort of privatization is a bit of a double-edged sword, but that in the long run, the areas that have less of a NIMBY attitude will end up with a much more vibrant community. Right, and if you think about the big picture here, where these kind of static single-family developments happen is in the suburbs and in the exurbs. This is a symptom of sprawl, which, as Adam said, is a government-created phenomenon. If you didn't have all these free roads going out to nowhere... Combined with the kinds of zoning restrictions in cities that force more development to the perimeter, then it's likely that more development would be happening closer to the city center rather than out in the suburbs, and that that development would have a stronger incentive for densification when it's created. So in other words, if I'm a developer going in and developing some property that's close to Boston or close to Manhattan, you know, that maybe has access to transit and a mix of uses, then I'm not going to limit that development to you know, single-family houses on one-acre lots. That would really be minimizing the potential for profitability based on the land value there and, and the amenities. So I guess the point is that it's not just these individual pockets of development that we need to look at. We need to look at the big picture and understand that these NIMBY type of covenant communities 
in many places are a symptom of sprawl. Yeah, and Adam made the point about the environmental effects of planning regulations, and sprawl would be one of those, where you've got far fewer people living on a much larger land area and driving their cars to and from work every day. And we've talked before about how these issues related to the built environment tend to be nonpartisan. So this is an example of an area where free market types like us can reach out to people on the left on one of their key concerns and try to explain how we can actually achieve their goals using a more free market approach, which they might otherwise not be willing to consider. You know, people on the left are often fond of, you know, wanting to vote on everything, right? Everything should be <laughs> decided democratically through some kind of consensus process. You know, even planning board is an example of that, where, you know, no individual can do anything with their own property until the rest of the neighborhood has voted on it. You often hear this, I mean, from everybody, of course, it's democracy, but I think more so from people on the left, where property rights and other rights are often subject to the will of the majority through some kind of process of voting. And they seem to think that this will bring about a more you know, fair and equitable society, although that didn't go so well in the last election for them here in the US. <laughs> yeah, they're all for majority rule until they realize that they're the ones who are in the minority. Yeah. And in fairness, there is a lot of gray area in negotiating development of the built environment. Certain property rights can be a bit nebulous where you're talking about infringement on neighboring properties or things like view rights and light rights and air rights and these types of things. Patrick made a point at one point that there needs to be some kind of a political process or political negotiation to resolve some of these items. But we need to be very careful about the limits of that. But an interesting point that Peter made in one of his questions is that increasing urbanism, this isn't something that people are going to vote on, you know, that people are going to choose. This is something that's happening and that's going to continue to happen. Based on the demographics, you know, this is something that's really inevitable. More so maybe in developing nations than in the U.S., but even in the U.S., I think we expect to see a higher demand for densification of our cities and possibly the development of new cities that can become more dense in certain areas, as Adam said, where there's a reason for that. So I think that that inevitable drive towards increasing urbanization and increasingly dense development is going to start to make the NIMBY position untenable at some point. As Patrick said, you already have some YIMBY movements in some areas, which is yes in my backyard, where people are showing up at planning board meetings and speaking on behalf of allowing more dense development and allowing more, more urban development and pointing out that the pleas of the incumbent homeowners to keep things the way they are are really just self-serving. They're not benefiting the broader community. In democratically run cities, there's an inherent bias in support of nimbyism, since it's the existing property owners who are typically opposing new developments. And of course, these existing property owners have voted for the local council, while anyone coming from outside that town or that city doesn't have any say until they actually buy a property and move there. But I think that in a privately owned and perhaps profit-driven city, the opposite would be true, where the owners of the city, whoever that may be, and that might not be one single entity that owns a whole city, but there may be, as we've said before, kind of competing landowner groups in various neighborhoods. And if they're looking to increase revenue, then they would be increasing services and marketing themselves towards people who don't currently live there in order to encourage more migration into their city. Yeah, that, that's a great point. It makes me think of something Patrick said where you know, one of the benefits here of being able to go back through and listen to the audio and transcribe it the way, the way that we have here is that you can pick up these little tidbits, you know, these little morsels of knowledge that were dropped along the way. And one word that Patrick used at one point was the word curation to describe the process of planning or what planning should be. And I think that's a good way to think about it, especially when you relate that to the analogy of a, of a city as a rainforest, like Adam said, or as Patrick had said before on our, on our show, a multi-species ecology. The idea of curation here, or I guess in the biological sense, it might be cultivation. <laughs> the idea is that you're not going in with a heavy hand and deliberately planting things here and there or really coming in with this grand master plan and dropping things down on the map. Curation is really a process of editing, right? It's a process of allowing things to develop more organically and then going in and kind of pruning and weeding to deal with the negative things that come up. So if you have a, a patch of rainforest in your backyard, you might not be going in and tearing down trees and planting new ones and importing monkeys and butterflies and birds and all this stuff. You know, you're just going to let that ecosystem develop on its own. But if you start to get some invasive weeds that come in, you might go and pull those out. Or if there's a tree that falls down, you might clear that out to some extent. Thinking about planning in terms of curation or cultivation 
especially in private cities, will really open up a lot of opportunities for more organic entrepreneurial development. So I get the analogy with a rainforest, but what would this kind of curation actually look like in the built environment? Would you be just every now and then you just decide a certain house doesn't belong, you just go in there with a wrecking ball? <laughs> no, it's not that literal. The point of planning or planning regulations is to try to mitigate adverse effects between adjacent property owners or maybe property owners within some given area. But the way that it does that is by setting all of these prescriptive requirements, you know, before somebody builds something, they say, you can't build that. Or what did Obama say? You didn't build that? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't build that. I bombed it. Planning regulations cut down a whole lot of entrepreneurial opportunity at the knees before anyone can even propose anything. It's already been shot down, you know, 10 years before in the planning code. I think that a process of curation would be more about looking at projects on an individual basis, understanding what potential adverse effects they could have on the property rights of others within the area, and coming up with ways to mitigate that. And in some cases, that might mean that that development can't go forward. But often there are ways to mitigate the negative effects, especially, you know, again, you don't often have steel plants getting built, you know, next to single family residential houses anymore. Yeah. The types of development that are prevalent today in cities are generally not that adverse to other uses within the same area. You know, it's not like you're going to have a skyscraper go up within a single family neighborhood. Have you been to Adelaide lately? <laughs> <laughs> right. We've got a few right down the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but again, that's probably a place where it's been restricted to single family type of stuff for a while artificially, that the rest of the neighborhood hasn't been allowed to develop to that level of density. And so now it's this kind of pent up demand for more dense development. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So in a private city, I could see some of this sort of curation occurring as possibly the result of, of a dispute arbitration where one neighbor might accuse another neighbor of you know, operating a tannery in their backyard or something like that and stinking up the whole neighborhood. <laughs> and then they'd take the dispute to a private judge who would most likely impose some sort of requirement on the offending party to either control the smell or to cease the activity altogether on that property. Yeah, and, and even before you get to that point, I think there is some validity in vetting these things before these projects get built. So something like a planning approvals process, I think, can be legitimate to create that public forum where people can come and state their objections to some given project. But as you said, when this happens within a privately developed city, I could imagine that process being much more about protecting property rights and mitigating harm rather than just kowtowing to the incumbent homeowners and ossifying existing development patterns with rigid prescriptive planning codes. One of the questions was about this new bill that's being proposed in California, SB 827. I don't know, are, are you familiar with this bill at all? Not really, no. I've learned a bit about it, mainly from the uh, Market Urbanism Twitter feed. It's a bill at the state level that would force local councils to allow more development around any major transit stop. So, for example, if it's within a certain walking distance from a light rail station or from a bus stop where multiple routes meet, then those local councils wouldn't be allowed to prevent someone from building a 10-story condo building within that whole area. And so this is one of those sort of awkward cases for us anarchists, where you're actually relying on a higher government power to force the local government to be less restrictive. And this is something that Patrick raised in our interview with him in relation to some stuff that's happening in London. So one example of this is that I think in Beverly Hills, there's bus lines that run through there. And as a result of this, Beverly Hills would essentially be upzoned and forced to allow much more dense development amidst all these mansions and everything that they have out there. <laughs> and so, of course, you've got all these kind of Beverly Hills Hollywood leftist types who are supposed to be champions of the poor and downtrodden, who are some of the loudest opponents of this bill, because suddenly it's hitting their backyard. So this bill hasn't passed yet, but it seems to be getting quite a bit of support. And it's a big deal within the market urbanism movement. And if it does pass, then it could set a precedent for other states to follow suit, which, even though it's not quite an anarchic solution, it's certainly a step in the right direction. Yeah, libertarians are often fans of you know, state rights and, and local rights as a check on the power of the federal government. But that really goes both ways. You, know, you do have situations where the state government or the federal government 
can become a check on overreach by local governments. For me, I don't really care where it comes from as long as the result is greater individual freedom and protection of property rights. Quick edit here. By the time we finished editing and got around to releasing this episode, SB 827 had its day on the California Senate floor, and unfortunately, it failed. And if you're into the nuts and bolts of political maneuvering and how these things really work, there's been a few good analyses written, which we'll link to in our show notes at anarchitecturepodcast.com slash ANA018. However, Scott Weiner is not giving up, and he actually has a few other bills that he's put forth that are intended to promote housing development along similar lines to this one. So it's certainly worth keeping an eye on what's happening out in California. The event was called Startup Cities, and there was that question at the end where the guy got up and kind of asked if if anyone had actually tried to start a city before, (laughs) and that was pretty interesting. (laughs) Yeah, I spoke with that guy briefly afterwards, and apparently he has done some investment, I guess, or, or has some involvement with people who are trying to literally start up a city. Yeah. You mentioned this one example of a guy who, who figured out what was required to incorporate a city, and now this guy essentially has his own city that he's incorporated. <laughs> I don't know how much of that he actually owns in terms of owning the property or how that works, but right. he said that essentially this whole city, or it's probably like a, t- a smaller town at this point, I'm not sure <laughs> what was already there or how much he's building up. Yeah. But he said this whole city is run by three people, and all they do is issue requests for proposals and review proposals and award contracts to people who are coming in and, and running the city. So where do they get their revenue from? Is there a, Do they actually charge taxes, or like, how does that work? Any idea? No, I, I don't know. We didn't get into that level of detail. But that's kind of the extreme end of this idea of startup cities, where someone is, is literally starting up a whole city and managing everything that happens to make that city work. I think part of Peter's intent behind Startup Cities is not just that, but also creating a a focus of attention for city-based technologies, such as, you know, maybe some of the smart city stuff we discussed in in our last episode, or maybe things like road management companies or utility management. Mm -hmm. So the idea of Startup Cities is really looking at cities as an entrepreneurial venture, whether that happens on the scale of the entire city or all of the various services that the city needs to operate. Right. And I should say that this isn't exclusively like a, a private city libertarian thing. Right. This includes services that work with governments of new and existing cities in order to help them do their job better. Usually when we hear the word startup, we think about tech companies, <laughs> you know, developing things for the web or computers or whatever. So in this case, Peter's really trying to draw attention to innovations that are happening within the realm of cities. Peter does have a, a blog post that's kind of a manifesto of of the intent behind Startup Cities. We'll link to that in the show notes. I thought Adam's response to that question was interesting where he, he kind of pushed back a little bit on the idea of starting up a city from scratch. And I think where he was coming from was that all the current cities have developed more or less organically where there's been some sort of a natural reason for a city to form in a particular location. And for the most part, they've also developed over a long period of time. So it certainly would be a challenge to start a new city and expect it to grow to sort of the scale of of some sort of major city on the scale of the cities that we have today, unless there was a specific reason for the city to be located in that particular area. Maybe a good example of where this has actually kind of happened somewhat recently would be the development of Silicon Valley in the sort of San Jose area, which is really driven by the fact that Stanford University was around there. So new cities could develop given sort of the proper seed and the right trends to allow them to grow. Now, I think one of the points that Peter makes is that with increasing populations and this trend towards urbanization, especially in the developing world, that there's opportunity all over the place for someone, you know, maybe not in America where things are pretty well developed, but certainly somewhere in the developed world. If you look at what China's been doing, they've just been building cities all over the place. Now, a lot of those, I think, are still ghost towns at this point. But if it was done not so much in a top-down fashion, but in a more entrepreneurial, bottom-up fashion, then... I think you'd have people who would figure out how to spot the best opportunities for founding a new city in order to meet the needs of the surrounding people. Yeah, again, thinking about cities as an entrepreneurial venture speaks to Patrick's response to that question, which was that in some cases where we hear examples of people trying to start up cities, part of the idea behind the city is that you're creating something for the purpose of making it more free, essentially, than other places. You know, something like a free economic zone, as he mentioned. 
So an example of this might be the seasteading project in the French Polynesian Islands, which I think Peter referenced at one point. Yeah. And there are a few other projects like this. There's one called Liberland, which I think Patrick had some involvement in uh, judging an architectural competition for. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where this guy found this piece of land that was unclaimed by... Yeah, it's between like Serbia and Croatia or some somewhere like that. Yeah, it's like in a river between two countries and because of whatever treaties they have on their borders, they both disagree about the borders and neither of them includes this particular yeah. island or something. And <laughs> yeah. so this, some guys claimed it and is trying to develop it and develop it in a way that it would be this kind of, you know, libertarian Galtz Gulch society. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Patrick's point there was that if you can do that, if you build a city that has significantly less restrictions on business and economic activity than other areas, then that creates a draw, that creates an attraction for that place that can give it a reason to exist without necessarily having some more organic reason. It's kind of a, if you build it, they will come kind of thing. Yeah, well, I mean, I was in Shenzhen, China in 2003, and it's a massive city, and it's, it's amazing kind of what's happened there over the last 20 or 30 years. And even when I was there in 2003, it kind of got the impression that it was this sort of little farming village that all of a sudden they dropped this massive megalopolis on top of it. Yeah. I think as of 2003, some of the people were still a little bit dazed and confused as to what had actually happened to their land. Yeah, I imagine it's harder to try to start up a city in a place that's already populated, even if it is relatively undeveloped. So did you have any other interesting conversations? So after the event, there was a networking session where people in the audience could kind of meet each other and talk to each other and talk with Patrick and Adam. And after that, a handful of us went out to a bar for a few drinks and then ended up going to a, another bar <laughs> for food. <laughs> so it was pretty cool. Of course, I got to meet these guys, a handful of the market urbanism guys, and then really spent some time you know, talking with them as the night went on. Yeah. I spoke with Nolan Gray, who's a, a great contributor over at Market Urbanism. And as Adam mentioned, he's now heading up, I think he said, the policy and research division of the Center for Market Urbanism, which is their new nonprofit organization. Yeah. Nolan has hosted the Market Urbanism podcast, which is they put out about six episodes, I don't know, a few years ago, with him interviewing other people who are on the Market Urbanism team, as well as other people working in the field. One of the people that Nolan had interviewed for one of his podcasts was Sandy Ikeda, who does a lot of writing for FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education. Yeah. And he has a number of articles kind of related to the built environment. One that I went back and read is called, Is There a Libertarian Architecture? <laughs> Which is kind of interesting. Yeah. On market urbanism, he was discussing Jane Jacobs with Nolan. But anyways, he was at the event. And so I, I got to chat with him a little bit. And I mentioned how I had heard him talking about Jane Jacobs on Nolan's podcast. And he kind of said, yeah, it seems like every time I'm on a podcast, I, all I talk about is Jane Jacobs. <laughs> <laughs> but he seems like a pretty big Jane Jacobs fan, yeah. as many of us are. <laughs> but if, if you're listening, Sandy, we'd love to have you uh, chat with us sometime about something other than Jane Jacobs <laughs> <laughs> here on an architecture podcast. I also spoke with Steve Smith, who is the guy who does the, the Twitter feed and I guess a lot of the social media for market urbanism. So is he as much of a wisecracker in real life as he is on Twitter? <laughs> um, well, he, he was very civil with me, so uh, no, I guess that didn't come across. I guess he saves it for the Twitter feed. Well, most of us do. And of course, I did reconnect with Patrick a bit. We talked briefly. He introduced me to a few people, so it was good to touch base with him. Yeah. Of course, a lot of other people were vying for his attention, too, but we did chat a few times uh, throughout the night. Yeah. And actually, Sandy was bending his ear for a while out of the bar, so... Yeah. Um, I don't know what they were discussing, but it looked like they were really getting into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I would have liked a bit of fly on, on that particular wall. But <laughs> <laughs> but that's one thing that was so cool about this event was that it felt like kind of a homecoming. It was this coming together of all of these people who are interested in these ideas of more free market approaches to the development of the built environment and of cities. So there were a lot of people there who were really kind of informed and, and knowledgeable about the ideas of market urbanism. And I was there too. <laughs> I did get to speak with Adam quite a bit. As you said before, we've been trying to connect with these guys for a while. So hopefully we'll keep up a dialogue and maybe try to get some of the market urbanism guys on our podcast for some upcoming episodes. The best part of the evening was that Adam gave a t-shirt for market urbanism. Ooh. <laughs> that says legalize cities. <laughs> That's great. Which I think is a great message. Adam said that he felt that market urbanism wasn't just this blog anymore, that it's really becoming a movement within the urbanist community. And for me, being at this event and meeting with all these people, it really felt like that. 
I had said in a series of episodes with Patrick that when we started this podcast, you know, we thought we were the only ones out there talking about this stuff. Yeah. And then, of course, we found Market Urbanism and we found Patrick, and we just keep finding more and more people who are on this wavelength and looking for ways to develop cities without relying on the government. Thanks for listening to An Architecture Podcast, the built environment of a stateless society. Visit anarchitecturepodcast.com to follow our blog and social media and find out how you can support us through Patreon or with cryptocurrency. And one of the questions they asked about this new California bill being proposed by Scott Weiner. Weiner? Is it Weiner? Weiner. Weiner. <laughs> Weiner. <laughs> I think it's Weiner. Yeah. A whiner. He's either a wiener or a whiner. You don't have to say it by him. Just say by you. This bill that was proposed. Yeah, but it's it's funny to make a wiener joke. Oh, you were trying to make a joke. I thought you were. Well, I don't know. I was I was groping my way towards a joke. <laughs> I will leave it. Whatever. This yeah, is, okay. We're getting we're getting a, we're getting a more sophisticated audience for this episode. So <laughs> not for long. <laughs>